we're going though. Okay, Eddie. Okay. Best of luck, guys, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh. Okay, let's just wait till it comes up. Okay, good morning, and welcome to Go Away Politics Live. My name is Neil Abrolacon, and my co host, Mike Garrity. Good morning, viewers. Uh, looking forward to the debate this morning. And with us this morning, we have three councillors. Uh, we have newly elected uh, Eddie Hoare, we have Colette Connolly, who was, was first originally elected in 2004, I believe. And uh, Michael Crowe as well from 2004. Yeah. Excellent. You're very morning. welcome, guys. Thanks for coming. Good morning. Good morning. So welcome to Galway Politics Live. So today we're debating housing, a thorny subject of housing, which is always a, a very interesting um, subject on Galway City Council. Um, so, I mean, I suppose what we'd like to do first is just get to know the councillors a little bit. Eddie, maybe you'd start as the newest councillor and just introduce yourself and tell us about yourself a little bit. Thanks, Neil. Eddie, councillor Eddie Hoare from the Galway City Central Ward from Bushy Park originally and working in town as an accountant for the, for the last 10 years, graduate of NUIG and a newly elected councillor to Galway City Council. Very good. And Colette? Uh, Colette Connolly. Um, I was elected first in 2004. Again in 2009, lost my seat in 2014, was co-opted in 2016 and re-elected, thankfully, in May. Um, I'm an independent councillor and uh, I come from Shantala and uh, work as a teacher also. So you took the circuitous route. <laughs> I did. And Michael, you, you've taken a bit of a circuitous route as well, haven't you? Have I? Elected as an independent, <laughs> I think, for you. You're going way back there. The other way around. Uh, 2004, um, I um, my name councillor Michael Crowe. Fianna Fáil, Galway City East, first elected in 2004, as I said, thankfully re-elected every time since, um, originally from Bohemore, um, and currently live in Briargill. Very good. So in terms of housing, um, in terms of housing, the first thing sort of to look at, I mean, we've, we've, got, a, we've got a serious problem in Galway. I mean, you know, there's, there's many companies wanting to move here to Galway, and um, there's many people want to live in Galway. I mean, the population is due to grow enormously, and yet people are finding both house prices and rents um, to be sort of prohibitive and I mean we had a situation in the past where it was roughly recommended that a third of people's salary would go towards housing. I mean we're now according to certain um, you know certain surveys showing that it's going up to uh, roughly half of people's salaries so it's becoming a real problem for people. Mm -hmm. So I mean maybe we'd, we'd start with Eddie I mean do you, do you have any views on how we're going to sort this out Eddie? Yeah and look I can concur with everything you are saying it has I suppose impeded on a lot of foreign direct investment coming to Galway is the housing is the housing crisis or the housing issues that present ourselves but to be fair I suppose there is a lot of measures that have been brought forward by the government in recent years and I think the measures that while they are slow they are welcomed by Galway and by uh, a lot of the companies that are hoping to come here I suppose there is obviously issues with regard to housing and the big issue is the lack of supply the lack of supply of private developments in Galway City and it's an issue and um, it hasn't happened overnight it's there and look as a newly elected councillor I fully acknowledge it as a member of the government party I fully acknowledge it we have to be conscious of the fact that there is a lot of strategic land in Galway City and you know, under the control of Galway City Council but we're restricted by an outer city bypass so a lot of that land is I suppose rendered void initially because the uncertainty surrounding the bypass but look I'm under no illusions in, re in relation to that obviously there is an issue in regard to the supply of housing but as a newly elected councillor and along with Mike and uh, Councillor Crow and Councillor Connolly I hope to form a part of making sure that that supply increases over the next five years and that there's more people in houses because the situation as it is at the moment there's rising rising rates of homelessness and no one likes to see that whether we like it or not or paint a good picture it's difficult to see that but I've no, under no illusions that the government and us here in the Galway City Council will make sure that that project is that more housing is delivered over the next number of years, and it has been. Very good, very good. Let what what would be your take on it? Uh, well, I've always said that, that um, one way of dealing with uh, an issue is to to face it head on, mm. and I think for for many years, certainly since two thousand and four, um, councillors did not bite the bullet. I said repeatedly there was a housing crisis. The numbers on the list back then were in and around, I think it was 1,200, 12, uh, and that almost doubled. Now we're at the, the stage where there's 4,100, in excess of 4,100 households mm -hmm. on a housing waiting list. So we're not making any inroads. In, in last year, we only had, we only took, built 54 units, 54 mm -hmm. units. 
2016, 130, 2017, 122. Our forecast up to 2021 is over in excess of 1,080 and 89 units. The problem with that is the vast majority of those units are going to be acquired under the CAF. Um, they're going to go to uh, voluntary bodies. They're not going to, they're not a direct build. And we are, I think government policies, while they have changed recently, there's still an over-reliance on the private rental sector to deliver housing mm -hmm. units. And 40% of Galway's housing is, is in the rental sector. That's quite considerable. If you compare it to Europe, the European model, where people pay on average a third of their income on rent, that's that's where we should be at instead of people now we're going to go back to tenement land of the, of the 1910s in dublin where people there's multiple occupants in a house because they can't afford the rent and the average rent is 12 in excess of 1200 now in galway or 895 for a one bed it is scandalous we need to have a government policy that delivers direct build social housing because the vast majority of people in receipt of HAP are need social housing. Yeah, could so you just can move explain HAP a little bit? Because I mean, I, you know, although people on the council <coughs> understand yeah. what HAP they is. The HAP is a an housing assistance payment uh, which came in um, in Galway in 2016. It was rolled mm. out here in Galway in 2016. And basically that has caps um, for one bed, two beds, uh, and so on. Now, in, in addition to the HAP, the, 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 the tenant also has to, can and normally does, pay a top-up payment to the landlord. Mm. And so that's even more money out of a very, very restricted budget. Now, the difficulty from my own experience with clients uh, is that it is actually very difficult to find landlords that are actually willing to go into the housing assistance payment scheme because they're getting more money out in the open market. And we saw this with previous schemes, such as the rental accommodation scheme, and which the HAP has now replaced effectively. Mm. And the same thing and the same failure with the rental accommodation scheme, at its height, we had in excess of 500 units in RAS. Now we have less than, I think it's 220. So the landlords are pulling out of those rental accommodation schemes the landlords are not willing to engage in long-term contracts. The consequence mm -hmm. for the tenant is l no security of tenure, no fixed rent, and they have their children starting in schools, they're in an area, they're part of the community, and they have, at any moment in time, they can get a notice to quit. So the primary problem is, is, is one, landlords are not willing to go into the scheme like the previous scheme in RAS or long-term leasing. And the second is the lack of security of tenure and the fact that they're paying top-up payments mm. to the landlord out of very limited budget. Okay. Michael, I mean, any views on sort of the issue to do with landlords? Because, I mean, wh why, why would landlords not wa want to get into the scheme? I mean, you must have talked to a lot of people over the, your years as a councillor. I mean, is, is, is that you know, accurate that landlords are sort of wary about going into the HAP scheme and generally becoming landlords? Yeah, the reality is that landlords don't want to, or aren't interested in, in basically, um, a lot of them certainly aren't interested in taking on board, uh, let's say, recipients of the HAP payment or potential recipients of the HAP payment. And that is a fact. I deal with a lot of people um, who come to me with regard to go looking for help to source accommodation mm. who have few properties and be it the letting agent or the landlord have informed them that they're not interested in HAP full stop. To come back to the original question that you mentioned, um, the, the whole area, the, the biggest problem with housing in both city, county and country, I suppose, in the last decade has been around supply of housing. Mm -hmm. That's the kernel problem. And let's say the government infrastructure around housing, be it rents, be it bills, has all primarily been driven towards the private operator, operator the private developer. And we've seen it here in recent times in Galway of where um, approved housing bodies have effectively bought um, estates directly off the builders. Mm. Um, and we had a case there in the Mona Bay Road of, let's say, 54 units of where Galway City Council bought the entire lot off the developer in that case. Mm -hmm. um, so any development that has happened bar one, up, and that hasn't happened yet, but it is, it is to happen this year or begin this year, but the vast majority of, of we'll say, new 
um, accommodation for people who might just barge on the public housing scheme um, has been through approved housing bodies and they have effectively bypassed the council and bypassed the council mm, mm. and that is a, a significant problem um, the councillors aren't aware of it the residents aren't aware of it um, and it's a fait accompli um, and that creates further problems um, so that in my view should not and cannot continue Okay. Okay. So just to come into that, Michael, for a second, you, you both kind of raised an awful lot of issues, which is very, very important on housing. But one thing I noticed, and it was alluded to last week at the debate on traffic, was that um, most of the industry is on the east side of the city, and most of the housing is on the west. And yet, I see a proposed development for Not Natara coming up pretty soon. And then, on the other hand, we don't see any movement on Ardon. Would you have any say, Michael, to start out with? Would you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, first of all, Mike, um, what you say there didn't happen yesterday or today. Yeah. It's been that way for <laughs> 25, 30 years. <laughs> the vast majority of people live on the west side and work on the east side. And that is a problem. And that is an argument, with the, uh, albeit a different one, that is an argument why a longer ring road would help alleviate some of the city centre traffic problems. Because at the moment, um, which you confirm yourself, the vast majority of people travelling from the west have to, at the very least, come in as far as over the Quincentennial Bridge and take a left in, um, whereas the outer, ci the outer city bypass, regardless of use of it, and data backs it up, would, would, would we say, take that issue away. Um, <coughs> and with regard to Ordon, I mean, we passed, the, the outgoing council, the last council passed the Ordon plan, we say late last year, and we zoned it appropriately, both residential and amenities and so on. And I suppose in effect, that's our job done to a point. Mm. Um, I presume the landowners in the area um, are currently meeting at the very least meeting with the planners discussing the potential plans for there um, I live over the wall from Ardon yeah. so I know it first hand and um, I understand um, that the we'll say the, the behind Galway Clinic if you like that part of it is to be the first developed and the council have secured funding to change the roundabout there to a traffic light system to open up access to those lands and in order to develop it so also from the council's point of view we are doing our bit uh, but we're reliant on, on others as well to come on board okay yeah now there is adequately <laughs> zoned land now mm -hmm. Owen Murphy the housing minister is getting it in the neck mm -hmm. you know he's, he's in your party I mean the government side of it I mean you know there's adequately zoned land in Galway there's no question about that Ardon is zoned there's there's mm -hmm. huge areas of land zoned for housing and yet there isn't, there isn't much happening I mean what do you see as the blockages Look, I fully acknowledge it. Um, the government are getting a stick in relation to housing, but there is a lot of measures being done by the government. I suppose mm. as part of Project 2040, the Land Development Agency was formed, and they were overseeing, I suppose, they have the land, the skill sets and the capital to supply houses in strategic uh, sites in Galway. I suppose it's important that they're delivered in the coming, in, in the coming years, but I suppose going back to the government, there are a number of measures that they have made to try and alleviate, I suppose, as Colette alluded to, the rental issue, so the short-term letting in Airbnb, so they brought in mm. new legislation to try and remove them from the short-term letting market, to bring them back into the long-term letting market, so that's a positive measure that's been brought into play by the government. Like I said, the Land Development Agency have 1.2 billion of capital at their disposal to invest and uh, develop strategic sites around the city, and regardless of what happens, they have a plan in place of 150 to build 150,000 houses so that's going mm. to alleviate the supply the supply issue 50,000 houses, houses nationally nationally and yes. do you know how many of those would fly to Galway city or county at, at, at about 10 percent are supposed to apply to, to Galway that's yes that. yes yeah, yeah. Um, that's 15,000 houses so I suppose just going back to your issue with regard to uh, with with regard to the housing I suppose the lack of supply like we had mentioned is a big issue so you have a lot of borrowers like like young people in their early 30s trying to get onto the housing market so they're paying excessive rents they're finding it quite difficult to form form deposits get the banks to back them so that's a big issue as well accessibility affordability mm. of borrowers to lend money from the banks is a big issue as well and I suppose while you can say the government this the government that they've learned from the lessons of the past and they have to I suppose lend a little bit more measuredly than they have in the past so that's outside of their control at the moment that would be another issue yeah and now Colette um, basically alluded to a very serious problem which is that the, because of the situation at the moment we're seeing increasing pressure on families we're seeing increasing in pressure on on social housing you know and that there isn't enough social housing within the city and I mean that is something that councillors have been screaming about for years and in fairness it's something that councillors of all parties have been screaming about and yet there doesn't seem to be much progress in that area I mean is there 
any any good reason why or what what's what's causing the problem well m- my experience over the last 13 years is that the government uh, successive governments mm. of all parties have just they've always relied on the private rental sector to deliver mm. or the private uh, developer to deliver housing units for sale or for purchase um, the problem here really is the price of land and you know at the moment Galway City Council have in excess of 32 million 32 million in outstanding loans mm. now to service those loans alone we have a half a million in our budget annually the Bally Burke site for example is 6.9 hectares of land cost the taxpayer over 12 million euros mm. 12 million 198,000 so you can see why there is the issue really for direct build is 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 directly it's, there's a correlation between the price of land and the lack of building mm. and and for a direct build for social housing I, I i think that over the years large social housing estates have got a very bad name particularly in dublin the ballymons the the the, the talus in galway i know myself i come from Shantala. equally i put up with chance all my life about social housing now, there's some irony in the fact that the Clada, the Chantilla and the Bohemores of this world have come full circle and are now one of the most expensive places to live and purchase property mm-hmm. because they're in a residential estate. I myself, I see absolutely no problem with building social housing. I think that the issues in the past around enforcement and tenancy agreement facilities, primarily the lack of facilities, and access to good public transport were, the, were, 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 were some of the reasons that certain estates mm. failed. But certainly not in Galway. I don't think we have anything like some of the problems that have been experienced in Dublin mm. in social housing. Um, I think social housing is anathema to a lot of councillors. I think that there's an awful lot of talk again about affordables. Now, the problem with the f- so-called affordable housing is define, define affordable. Now, the last scheme in Galway, adopted by Galway City Council, there's 72 unsold units, which Galway City Council could not divest themselves of. 72 units. Galway City Council has 72 units. And the loans on those. Which they own and they can't get rid of. And they can't get rid of. So in order to to deal with that issue, the (coughs) 72 units were given over temporarily (coughs) to the housing voluntary bodies. Okay. For for, 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 for for social housing. The, that is the problem. Everything is reactive. And when it, there's calls again for social house, uh, for affordable schemes. Now, are there people living in those houses now? There are, yeah. yeah there are, yeah, through yeah. the voluntary through bodies. Through the voluntary bodies. Mm. But again, what is the government saying? With all the voluntary bodies that exist nationally, what they're really doing is divesting the local authority of its obligation mm. to provide housing and we're duplicating, triplicating, quadrupling the administration, the administrative costs of housing, of delivering housing. You have TUA, you have Respond, you have Cluid, just to name but a few that operate in Galway. In addition to that, you have specific Simon and Cope who provide units for, for who are, who have a skill set to provide uh, units for people who have uh, addiction problems or uh, other problems. The the issue I see is it's a total waste of taxpayers' money <coughs> to be having multiple CEOs of all of these uh, uh, voluntary bodies, and instead of giving that money to the local authority to do what it does best, provide housing. It's somehow ludicrous for us as councillors to be handing over units of housing to the voluntary sector. I really, I, I, I think it'll be the next greatest scandal and mm. waste of taxpayers' money. So again, coming back to, the, there was, back in 1973, there was what was known as the Kenny Report. Mm-hmm. And the, the suggestion back then was to acquire land at agricultural value plus 25%. Mm-hmm. Many of the, the, uh, the suggestions in that report were never followed. By, by government, and now we're in a situation where we are <coughs> totally overly reliant on 
the private sector to deliver and they're not building for whatever reasons the developers are not building usually it's because the margins aren't large enough for them or the the the, or the, the banks aren't lending perhaps. and the bank the banks also have mm. a role in that now housing is a basic right i think it should be inserted in the constitution i think it has the greatest the lack of good quality housing has the most negative effects on people's mental health and well-being mm. and physical health <coughs> and for since january alone i think i've dealt with five clients who had notices to quit mm. from their landlords some of them were in their houses for 10 years 10 years so the disruption that causes to those families in those communities attending the local schools is quite significant on their mental health. And I have, I've gone in to and talked to the executive and this is the response you get. Would you go to the county? Would you live in the county? Now, I don't know what planet people live on <laughs> to suggest that a family with children in a community attending local schools would go to Orden Moor and the executive is telling them, but there's a bus from Orden Moor. I mean, that, that simply is really unacceptable. And since no, they're not very good buses, as we found well, out they're in not, our, and last the, week. You know, the, it's not a regular bus service. No, it's not. It? And it's also the expense of that if you're on a limited budget. Mm. And the problem is that since 2011, the, the, there was new legislation brought in which, which took away the choices from someone on the housing waiting list since 2011 the new regulations came in and they stated that anyone on a housing waiting list was satisfactor satisfactorily uh, housed if they took uh, voluntary housing if they took RAS scheme or if they took the long-term leasing they did not have a choice to stay on the list for social housing and i think that is a huge problem I think just a, a point in relation to Colette, I suppose, I think it is a bit pedantic of you to be attacking the housing agencies. When we have such an issue, 4,000 families on a waiting list, it's important that these are ec these people are put in homes, regardless of who's building them, it's important that these people are put in homes. I think the cost element should be secondary. It's important that these people are housed effectively in the next number of years, no matter what way they're done. Mm. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, we're dealing with a big issue here with a lot of, let's say, 4,000 families. So regardless of Clued Respond to if they're private developers, it has to be, they have to be put into homes, and that's the most important thing. And speaking yeah. of, of finding homes, I'm sure you'll all have noticed on the canvas uh, the amount of houses that are boarded up. <coughs> so when we're talking about housing stock in Galway and families being homeless, there's an awful lot of houses through the whole of Galway that are boarded yeah, up. Yeah, and the census and says over 10% of houses 10 in Galway City are actually empty, to me whereas it's 1% in the UK. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that it's very, very slow to get them done. And I was wondering... Maybe it's not fair to ask Eddie because he's just come onto the council. Maybe <laughs> Michael, first of all, we'll give you a chance. Uh, we can't, we can't lay it all on Michael, no, but anyway, maybe you have Eddie yeah. would know uh, why, yeah, why no, did it take so long. Yeah. We get a regular quarterly report on housing, and uh, ultimately, there's always, a, uh, I think, off the top of my head, an average of 60 to 70 houses that are yeah. at least that are. Probably um, even more, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that uh, depending on the period that are boarded up is the and phrase. Why, Michael, do you find that the experience of being for so long ever so slow to, to actually. The, the, to there, there just is a genuine. Um, there appears to be what uh, a, a, just a genuine slowness, uh, <laughs> to be blunt about it, in turning them around. And is there any way of putting a light under the mandarins and speeding up the process? Do you think? Well, possibly, um, you know. And I think, but I think no matter how how big that problem might be viewed by some, it's still only a very very small problem in the overall, uh, you know, in the overall issue in the city. It, it would certainly help, yeah, and all councillors have continuously raised it and will continue to raise it. I imagine. But to answer, Neil asked a question earlier. What is the problem? Uh, what I think this is how we put it, what was the problem mm. with regard to housing supply yeah. <coughs> um, in the last number of years and ultimately there's one word that is the answer I believe that's the problem and that's money money so there hasn't been mm. any money um, uh, over the last number of years supplied to any local authority and I, th I think myself government themselves have struggled because I, I, you know I don't think that they're as um, well off as, um, as we would all like them to be um, so I think that, that that's ultimately the problem and in, as I said, in the last, w you know, you go back to, to, to what was built, I think between off the figures off the top of my head, and between 2004 and 2010, there was, in, there was 155 local, uh, per local authority, there was an average of 155 um, units built a year. And since from 2011 to 2017, there was something, something like 36 
funeral spilt yeah. um, across the country. So those are the issues. Um, uh, Fine Gael, and this is um, obviously, um, I'm not having a go at Councillor Hall because he is uh, Councillor Hall, he's new, but I'm having a go at the government as a whole who have been there a lot, lot longer. <coughs> um, and ultimately, I come back to the point is that this government, whether it's housing or transport or, or health, is primarily interested in the market and letting the market dictate um, and letting the private operator in all of those markets dictate um, how policy goes. And ultimately, um, if the if Galway City Councils do not get money, they cannot build. Uh, and the, another problem too is, to be frank about it, is that we had an instance last year on the last council mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. where um, the chief executive walked in one evening, literally, this is not an exaggeration, this is spelled walked in and he said, we are building modular homes on a site in Westside. I have signed the oh order. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. a complete done deal. And there you are. Um, so ultimately, um, you know, despite what we might, us councillors... Just, just to pull back on that, Michael, for a second. I mean, don't the councillors have the power? I mean, I've heard about the stories about the city manager browbeaten at times as well. But what I would say is that the councillors do have the ultimate authority. But basically, you could have a vote of confidence if you were being treated like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, at the, the, that's, I suppose, the nuclear... Yeah, the I nuclear know the option. nuclear option. Yeah, um, but it might be a good little turn uh, to, to just throw it there. Yeah, John. Don't ever doubt for a second that I'm afraid of any nuclear option. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you're doing that. Well, we're not going to nuke um, the place, shall we? Just to go off for a second, uh, and times we're bringing left wing Eddie in on this one. Yeah. I'd like to know your opinions on property tax and how you think that's going to go. Mid asphalt Stephen, maybe Eddie first, collect then, and then Michael. So Eddie. So local property tax. I did welcome the government kicking it out to next year for the review, but I suppose. It's important, look, when uh, I'm new to local government um, and the guys to my left, Colette and Councillor uh, Councillor Connolly and Councillor Crow will know, when it comes to budget time, the local property tax is a big income stream for the local authority. We have to make sure that there's sufficient funds in the in the budget yeah. to, to to expend on, on certain projects thro- around the city. So I think, obviously, look, local property tax is there. It's been spent... I think pro- I think it's been well spent. Um, in terms of an increase, fifty. I would don't think that I'd be in favour of a proposed increase in the next budget. That would be my own opinion. But I do well. I do feel that we have the local property tax there, and as long as it's been as long as the money that comes from local property tax is spent properly and spent within our local authority, I think it's a it's a good measure. And what about you, Colette? I don't agree with the property tax <laughs> to fund... With no any property tax at all? No, I, I don't, no. And no. I, I, I don't agree with any property tax on your home, on a person's home. I think most people I speak to are absolutely irate right across all social spectrum in relation to the property tax. The property tax has simply... It is a replacement funding for the local authority whereby before we would get capital grants to build housing or roads we, we are not getting those now so we have substituted that tax that income with property tax i i would not be in favor of any increases in the property tax and the reason why is the, the property tax is levied at a market value of a house the mm. people that do that evaluation are in the business yeah. of making money out of houses you know the auctioneers for example so how do you say that the house that you bought that you paid your mortgage on for 20 30 years that you paid your stamp duty on as well at the outset uh, is now somehow uh, this the source of a revenue stream for local government am i in favor of property tax on on second homes and third homes yes i am because then it is a different matter. Is it is right? not your home. Now, the issue comes back to funding of local authorities. We lost 100 staff in City Hall in the recession. 100 staff, a quarter of the staff were lost. And we were on a shoestring budget. So you come back to the vacant houses, if I may, and just say something about the vacant houses. Mm. Of the, the local authority housing stock, which is 2,000, in excess of 2,142 units, at any one time, the executive tell us is 2.5% vacancy rate. So that's about 70 houses on our quarterly report. The, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem in turning around those units. Some of the, there was two houses in Cladder vacant over two years. There's a house in Monster Avenue vacant over two years. When I seek to inquire, I was informed that there was an issue with uh, the insurance payout, which f- following a, f- a fire, it, sub- it subsequently came through. Of those 70 houses, 
uh, I recall, there's over 10 that are vacant and for more than five years. So yes, maybe in the new council, we can hold the executive to account for not putting those back into housing stock. Now, separate to that is the, is the, is the vacant houses and the vacant lands in the private sector. Yeah. Now, under the new legislation, which came into force as of January 2019, the local authority can levy a vacant site mm -hmm. levy. Now, mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. in the process. To, there, is, there is a staff person appointed <coughs> to deal with that. We haven't seen that come through. But I think the executive is very slow to use the existing legislation. But they for don't example, seem to be doing it no, at all. No, they're not. In Louth, you know, for example, they use the old Housing Miscellaneous Act mm -hmm. to acquire 50 units of housing. 50 units of housing that were vacant in Louth County Council, the smallest county in Ireland, and they brought that back in. Yeah, so to staff the couldn't be an issue there when I that asked, was small county. When I asked the executive, how could Louth do this? And we don't. You get you you get no explanations. Well, Colette, the object of the exercise is to stop the dereliction. So you have actually currently less than sixteen units listed on the derelict sites register in Galway City. Now I think every councillor, <laughs> and I've said this in the council chamber, would know multiples of those units. Now, uh, currently, there are less than 16 sites on the derelict house sector. I, I, I know ones down in Henry Street that are vacant for 30 years. Well, I, mean, I, I would say that, that Councillor Connolly is now um, part of the controlling pact in Galway City Council. <laughs> I think that's important to mention. Um, I, I've heard Councillor Connolly criticise both all parties and successive governments. That's, uh, I have been there in a different light. I believe you're better off. Um, I think the country and the city is better off with, with, with the party approach rather than the independence. I think that um, it's easy to criticise. Um, there are currently, I think offhand, six independents in the controlling pact in Galway City Council. They come from different, um, I suppose, spectrums. But um, Councillor Connolly, if, 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 if she is interested, um, can allocate and get her group to allocate specific funds to do specific things on those matters yeah, come budget time and arguably her and her t her PACs influence are far greater than Councillor Hoare's or I's. Um, yeah, but, but would you be in favour of it um, Michael? In favour I mean, of what? You know is there, yeah. you know I think a lot of these things come down to consensus in, in terms of actually um, sort of ramping up the derelict sites register. I think a lot of these things come down to willpower. Yeah. I think they, that's what they come down to. They come down to the want to do them. Be it so surely there actually. should be a want from all 18 councillors. Well, if there's, a want, if there's a want from councillors, councillors' views on what's right or wrong, but I imagine yeah. in this case, the majority, or certainly, or should I say them all, or maybe at the very least majority so. would be that way. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, you know, when you're, s when, when you're in the council, and I've been on, this is my fourth council, yeah. and you're in the, as I said, in the controlling pact of that council, your influence over the officials and executive is greater, greater than, okay. than others. And it's but that simple. And but I hope to exercise that in well. come, come, come the September <laughs> budget. But you, we all know the reality of the pact doesn't go across all aspects of the council. I mean, no. particularly yeah. in relation to derelict sites, it's there to elect mayors. It's not the same well as government. I, I didn't find that in my time when I was in the controlling pact. You did. You did actually all vote um, as as a group. Not all of the time, but mm. certainly I was in, in the in particularly come to come back to the transport issue in, when I was chair of the transport uh, SPC <coughs> on the last council. There was more done for public transport in this city in that five years than was done in the previous 20 and the last five or six mm. or 10 even and that is a fact supported by bus corridors supported by the changes around about life supported by all those measures because there was a will and a want to do it, despite aggressive tactics used by businesses who believed it wasn't in their best interest but it was at the time but didn't that come down to unanimity across the whole council though no, i mean it came down to the majority just down to the pact no it came down to the majority of the pact i think all of the pact on most issues at the time <coughs> and certainly the majority is a council. Well, well, in fairness, I think I it. think most councillors supported that now. You know, well, and I, I mean, I think I, I suggest you to go back to the minutes and check that. But fine, uh, you fine, know, we will discuss yeah. that maybe yeah. another time. Just that aside, as well, just going back to Councillor Crow and Councillor Connolly's points with regard to the government, we do have to remember where we came from when the government came into office in two thousand and eleven. We were the trika was in Ireland. Obviously, we we're looking at a second bailout. We were borrowing billions on the open market, paying right. massive amounts, fourteen percent yields on on the monies we were borrowing so 
At the moment, the economy is growing. Pascal Dunahoo announced a balanced budget for the first time in a decade last year. Employment, unemployment levels are at record lows. So I'd expect, based on that and the extra revenue coming into the to the exchequer through employment taxes, through VAT, through corporation taxes, should give sufficient funds to the government and to the local authorities. And I'd hope that that would work its way down to the local authorities and give us sufficient funding to make sure that some of these projects are delivered. And it is important that it but is. Is it the time to start I doing that now, though? Yeah, I hope that it does as well, and it does filter down more so in the next couple of years and few years than it has done. Mm. Um, you know, and I acknowledge that where the country was in 2011 after the Fianna Fáil and Green government, no argument there. Um, a decade later, however, you know, that's where it's at. Uh, I would also be of the view that, you'd say, Detroit, when they were in town, were able to keep the controls and the shackles on the current the current government and its ministers at the time and as soon as they left town uh, things began to come off the rails with regard to the national broadband scheme with regard to the children's hospital and so more and we've seen the prudence of Minister Dunham who now go out the window um, in the last number of years and it's it, it's a government that's become flahoo looked at in, in, in if you ask me with regard to public money but I would certainly welcome um, them to send down some money here which I would hope would not be wasted on pub badly needed public and which we haven't discussed much but which is a vital component of the housing issues in the city and affordable housing mm. schemes which you know despite what councillor Connolly says uh, define affordable there is many ways which you can define affordable using research data income so on and it is a necessary component of the housing mm. solution to this city and i believe that people are entitled who who have a, a reasonable income who are above the threshold for social housing mm -hmm. getting squeezed there and cannot afford in the city of galway to be honest 250 300 thousand euros and more in some places to buy a home we, we as, a go as a Fianna Fáil party believe that those young people and the arguably old people would you believe actually since as we stand today if you went back to 2000 and 2002 I think it was offhand the average age of a homeowner is 28 years old mm, mm. in 2016 the average age of a homeowner is, is 36 mm. so that, that them figures alone if you knew nothing else about what's going on in the landscape of Ireland that would tell you a story and it's important that would say while we push for social housing look to develop it that the affordable that there's a fresh affordable scheme which I understand is coming back in and I understand that uh, and have again um, information um, to, to support this that Fianna Fáil used its influence in the conference supply to help deliver to help deliver that and that's uh, you know uh, important as well look just go back to I fully agree with uh, Councillor Crowe's in, mm -hmm. in Councillor Crow in relation to the affordable scheme. I'm surprised that Councillor Connolly is so opposed to an affordable scheme. I'm not. We, actually, I, I'm not I like believe to you, you did um, no. refer to it earlier in in your comment. The affordable housing uh, scheme is really really important that we have it. Obviously, not disregarding social housing, we obviously need it, and the City Council is to deliver a thousand new homes in the social housing uh, schemes. You're asking for a definition of affordable housing I think mm -hmm. it's quite obvious and Councillor Crow alluded to it just there if your income or your joint income is in excess of the 35,000 so in excess of the social housing um, limits in the city it's, it, that's basically your affordable housing and if you can't effectively raise a mortgage for a, a private home so that's your affordable housing so you'd be saying within the bracket of 35,000 to 75,000 and it gives them a little bit of leeway to try and get on the private market. Yeah, and I think I think you're all talking. I'll, I'll let you in in a second, Clef. But I mean, I think you're all talking about affordability. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, I just like to raise the issue of students as well, because I mean, we have yeah. students coming to this city, and I mean, I'm I'm working in the university. You know, we, we see people, families are are spending six eight thousand euros to send one person per annum to to college. You know, that's what they have to pay for accommodation. Mm -hmm. And if you've got two or three children attending university, I mean, it becomes absolutely impossible for families to afford that sort and of thing. And the affordability money. and the high rent prices is a consequence of the lack of supply of private development and private homes, and that's what it is. Is so that the, the only thing? Well, that, definitely the, one of the, 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 one of the major things. The, I mean, there's high demand for rental properties. Pro the price mm. of rental accommodation is high in the city. If we can get more houses built, more people on the property ladder, there'll be less demand for private rented accommodation and the price will come down. It's supply and demand. It's very but simple. The government has brought in things like rent caps. They have done, yes. and They're, they're not working. I mean, people are... People I know are there's, there's obviously loopholes. Really there working. is loopholes to the mm. some, some landlords have to get out of them. But look, they've brought in the measures and it's important that they're monitored and legislated. We really are... Well, I just want to correct something. I, 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 I certainly did not oppose affordable housing. I raised the question of the success 
of the affordable scheme that we had previously, which has left Galway City Council with 72 units mm -hmm. <coughs> that they had to dispose of. And I, the, I, my recollection at the time was an affordable house came in at around 230,000 back then. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm well aware of what the affordable scheme is. It's 50,000 income for a single and 75,000 for a couple. Uh, we have just um, had 130 applications uh, for the Rebuild in Ireland scheme in the local authority, Galway City Council. We're operating for that. We've processed 38 applications mm -hmm. for 6.6 .6 million. I am not against an affordable scheme. There are okay. many people caught in the, the income bracket. Uh, they don't qualify. What I'm doing is questioning what is affordable in terms of what people <coughs> can pay back and wha what, what the valuation is going to yeah, be on the house. Well, are they going to go into... It doesn't sound very affordable to... No, to and are it. they going to enter into mortgages of in excess of 30 or 35 years mm. as opposed to 20 years in the old days? Um, the, 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 that is one issue, the affordable. But what I do want to say is in our own city development plan, mm -hmm. up to 2021, with the expected growth of population in excess of 98,000, we have a projected need of 8,500 housing units. Of that, it is declared in there by the planners that over 5,000 of those will be in need of social housing. So I am simply saying and outlining the priority. The yeah. priority will be for the provision of social housing. That is not to say that there isn't also a need for affordable housing. Yeah, so that's very clear. You, um, clear, Colette, you are not <coughs> opposing that. Michael, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, just, well, Councillor Connolly has made it clear that she's not against affordable housing. She's made it clear that her priority is social housing. So. That's, that clarifies that. You take the area that I represent, which is Galway City um, East, mm -hmm. and you take the Ballyban Road there. And so you say, if you're on the Ballyban Road, and as the crow flies over to Jehishka Road, that in that pocket alone in the city, there's approximately, as we stand today, 56% of the total social housing units in the city are, are in, we'll say, are in that area. Now, I believe that if there, you need a better social demographic across areas to include affordable schemes as well as social schemes that any one be it all private all social all affordable is never the best that there should be a mix it should be mixed right across the city it should be a mixed right across and the city the and country. that's why in, in that area in particular that i would believe that an affordable scheme would be much more welcome and be beneficial to everybody the residents that live there the potential purchasers and the, and the development of the city as a whole itself okay. uh, and that should be a priority and just for our viewers can I get you to speak a little bit louder <laughs> <laughs> just give me a bit of feedback that the sound is a bit quiet okay. and in a minute you might uh, let me address a question here just then. again uh, before you do Mike just sure, again yeah. and in our first council meeting I do welcome the Rebuilding Ireland home loan so it was a massive interest in that particular loan which gives preferential rate to first time buyers who have been turned down by two pillar banks um, so it's a there's going to be five million um, put out by the government in that scheme rolled out there's been 17 people housed over the scheme since it's been launched as part of the rebuilding ireland so i do welcome that there's also another quite good scheme that's there the help to buy scheme so we're on about the owner's rent levels of 1200 being the average rent in galway it's difficult for young couples to but get their deposit together but there is a help to buy scheme that's out there and it's an initiative from the government which gives you your poe taxes or your dirt tax paid over the last five years so for a young couple gives them the opportunity to bring a deposit so there are two schemes from the government as part of rebuilding Ireland that I would welcome and hope are exercised well in the coming years. Okay um, we're coming live here from Busker Browns today we've got about another uh, 10 minutes 13 yeah. minutes left on the broadcast Mike um, you had a few questions from viewers Yeah so we, we've been getting a bit of feedback and uh, first of all thanks Joe Lachman for your question because Joe got into us last week as well so we have a question from Joe uh, People before Profit Galway explicitly call for derelict sites registered to be used during the election. We posted houses that were empty and counted a lot more conservative estimates than we see in local media. So what he's basically seeing was he thinks that the, there's a lot more houses that are boarded up and not being used than is actually being said Absolutely. in the 7800. Absolutely. Could we quantify it anymore? I mean, even going around the constituency, City Central, I can tell you, there was a lot of houses there and like 70 does seem very, very conservative to me. Well, a lot of the houses aren't on the list. A lot of the houses aren't on the list for different reasons. 
If they're subject to a planning permission, uh, that's live, they're not on the list. If they, the owner of the property has engaged with uh, the planning in City Hall, the enforcement, uh, then it will not appear on the list. So you will see a lot of the hotels or the spinnaker, a lot of the garage out in Salt Hill, mm. they do not appear on the list. On the list. But yes, it, the, the question <coughs> really is, 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 it seems to me is, <coughs> is, is that they should be on the list. Okay. They should be on the list until at which point the dereliction is, 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 is no longer on the site. That's fine. Uh, Michael, just one other question to go back on. Y you know the, the property tax itself, um, do we generally use the full 15% or have there been various percentages used because you can use up to, there's a kind of a leeway of 15% isn't there? At, at local authority level. Local authority level. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. So we're no, we normally use the full. Yeah. I'm not sure the rate offhand as I speak today but um, we, we haven't raised it in Goal City Council for Goal City Council hasn't no, raised it in the last number of years. The other point I was going to so make is... you have a leeway there yeah. between you know, yeah, you are, are, are adjusted accordingly. Yeah. But yeah. So. And we've stuck to it. And is it the same with uh, the county council? Are their figures similar? Or are they I don't know about them. Okay. I don't know. You're not the county of the city. Huh? That's fair enough. So at Eddie, moment, that's uh, a very uh, fair comment. Yeah, Eddie, mine, mine is more of a national question to you. <coughs> it's the fact that there's an election coming up in the next eight months or so, mm. and um, what do you think is going to happen with property tax? With property tax, from a national point of view. National point of view. Yeah. I would expect, and look, based on rising house prices, I'd expect that the thresholds will be reviewed. I'd hope that there'd be leeway given to those, and those that are, have the money and affordability to pay will have to pay, and those that don't, there might be a little bit leeway. I'd expect the thresholds will be increased slightly, and there might be some measures, but I'd hope that across the board, that the government introduce a fair scheme, which I think, in fairness, the last scheme, while it was difficult to implement, it was fair, and as long as people know that their taxes have been spent accordingly and spent wisely, I don't think they mind paying it. Okay, there, there was a lot of talk the last time about it being a site tax as opposed to an actual building tax itself, and what would you think is the main leeway for that? Again, to my knowledge, look, the local property tax as it is at the moment, I think is probably the, the way forward, um, and that would be my opinion on it okay. with regard to that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just actually, that that is a good point, Mike. I mean, the site tax is about, you know, site valuation well, tax is to try and encourage people to actually build, mm. do you know, because if there's a disincentive, I mean, what I'd like to sort of focus on really, be just we're coming to the end of the of the broadcast here now, is sort of what people feel that as a councillor you can actually do, or as a council as a whole, if, if, if you could all come together and agree on a way forward, I mean, what would it be? What are the measures that could be brought in? to try and improve the housing situation in Galway for everybody. I mean, what, what, what are the big hits? Are there any big hits? Or is it a case of doing a lot of little things well? Or is it, as Michael says, um, money? It's all down to money from the government. Again, just going back to it, um, a, a mix of social and affordable housing, not one density of one, a high density of, of one particular type, a good mix of social and affordable. Another point that can't be lost, I suppose, is but that... How do we do that? I mean, how can we make that happen? You know, I mean, it's, it's all very well saying we'd like that. But, well, I mean, funding there, is there a measure to, I suppose we can funding has to come from the government. At the moment, you have 53, last week, 53 families in emergency accommodation across Gal in Galway. We're spending 320,000 per, per month, that's 4.2 million per year, mm. on emergency accommodation. I know the government are introducing family hubs. It's a nicer environment for young people to grow up. So let's say at 4.2 million per year you could service a loan at provincial rates of 100, 100 million over 30 years that 100 million would go a long way to ensuring there could be more social more affordable housing put in place in Galway and that's one measure I think and there's funding available there that's been I suppose not wasted but it's dead money that's been spent on emergency accommodation and that money if we could invest it in social affordable housing could be a, a money well spent at least the capital repayments would be in property that's owned by the by the local authority. So Colette, if you could get agreement from the pact, if you could get then further to that agreement from the officials to actually implement the um, you know the policy put forward by the pact, and if indeed you could get consensus from everybody, I mean, what would you suggest? What sort of measures would you suggest could be brought forward by the council to improve um, you know the housing crisis I as it is? I don't think the pact is going to change the government policy in relation to housing. I think what uh, the majority of councillors in Galway City Council can do is highlight the inadequacy of current 
policies in relation to housing. Yeah, I think what we can also would you bring well, in? There's no. th well, um, within our power, is within our remit, is, for example, the retrofitting of houses, to put more money in the budget for the retrofitting of houses in our social stock in terms of, of um, <coughs> climate change. And w some of the, 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 the housing stock we have is, is, is in bad need of retrofitting. Uh, I think we can advance uh, better planning, uh, better transport solutions, so that you can actually build in the city centre. And, and the census, the population in the inner city has fallen. We need to actively encourage residential in the city centre through other policies, which is public transport, or from a planning perspective, or from a recreational amenities perspective. So I don't think that the councillors per se are going to change uh, the, the, the rebuilding Ireland and the, the targets that the government has set for the local authorities. There's still an over, totally over-reliance mm. on the public. I think we're, we're, we're seeing uh, student accommodation being built. But again, I think that it's all by private developers and we talk about integration. Mm -hmm. But all of the, the units, for example, the Westwood, is they're all students in one location. I don't know that that is necessarily a good thing. There's no integration there. Mm. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, I think that notwithstanding the concerns of local residents in the area, that it is actually a good thing, not just for that. The student accommodation. Yes, yeah, so generally mm. speaking, I think that the students get down on by a lot of people, um, some rightfully so. But ultimately, like let's let's look at it like from a different point of view for a minute. If you take a development even the west side, and there's other areas being pro be being uh, proposed around the city <coughs> for student accommodation. First of all, the, the people that the, the entities that operate these are professional bodies. Um, they have a twenty-four hour reception. Um, they're they're housed properly. They're mm -hmm. looked after properly. If they act up, so to speak, they're disciplined, um, so on and so forth. These are the vast majority of these developments are professionally run outfits with no nonsense. The other thing it does is what it does is that if you have a space like that where it has three hundred and fifty units in it, approximately, okay. That takes the 350 um, occupants, or arguably the 500 occupants in the 350, if you understand what I'm saying there, yeah. out of estates around the west side, out of Laurel Park, out of Belsize Court, and out of Park, up Park and it frees up further beds. Yeah. And uh, you see, the, the, the image that a lot of people in the city, and every city have of students, is uh, waking up to uh, 10 or 12 people going nuts at 4 in the morning. That's still rare enough. It's it does happen, it's but it's rare happen. enough. Mm -hmm. um, so look, at we, we, we have to be look at it from the positive point of view. And I think those student accommodations professionally run are the way a modern city goes. Um, and that's just the way it is. We have to accommodate them. <coughs> They're an integral part of the city. They're much needed during mm -hmm. the off season. And we cannot continue to just, as I said already, down on them. Um, uh, th they need to what would you think of a development like what's happened with the Westwood, though, where the university have always took the right-hand side of the road, their accommodation, and Carter Village, as is, is expanding and going further out? And now you have another student unit up there as well too. I think in, in my honest answer to that question, Mike, is that I think in time it's going to be fine. And I think there's a little, this is my own view, um, I think there's a, a, an obvious, and maybe, maybe if I was living next door to it, I might have some concerns as well. I acknowledge that, okay? I think there's a certain amount of hysteria around it. But I think, in, as I said, in the fullness of time, that that development will work out. Mm. If, 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 what, if what we um, are led to believe and understand from the operators of it, I think in time it will move around. And I think actually it will benefit people in time, as I said, and benefit communities in time. And arguably you will get more people, whether they're long-term renting or owner occupiers, in the, in the houses and apartments that these are going to free up. Just uh, with regard to Councillor Crow, and I do agree, look, it is a positive step for student accommodation to be brought in. But my big, qu uh, my big, um, issue with it and the reservations of the locals in the Dangan area is the location of it. It's a, I suppose it's so we're socia socially deprived in the area and it was a mm -hmm. big resource that was taken from us. And I agree with taking the students out of the estates and it will free up that rental space but just the, the location of it I just think I would disagree with and I suppose the engagement with the residents locally is probably where the Would you agree I mean with student accommodation uh, Sorry, it's like yeah. important to make clear that like, that's all well and fine but I mean to, to, sum up, sum up, to sum up that case is that, that the, the builders of that development went into city council and with, I, with X amount of units to build in there and they were told by the council mm -hmm. you don't have enough 
build some, in, include some more. And they went to the board, and the board said the same, and the board sanctioned that. So, and the board is is governed by the government of the day. So, in, in essence, we can't. We have to be fair to everybody. <coughs> and ultimately, is that I understand Councillor Cole's concern, but but the reason they're able to do that, and that's the thing that we didn't have a chance to get into today, is the developers going directly to the board. Because I don't know whether m that many people realise it or not, but whether you, when is it the planning board? The planning board, planning board which influences housing too. Yeah. And we've seen a recent decision in in uh, Barna being overturned by the High Court yeah. only last week with the Garthy. But if you build off the top of my head, these are figures. If you if you have a site and you wish to build, I think it's a hundred private residential units or two hundred student units, you can go directly to the board. Um, and an important part of that is that a third party submission that's made to the board isn't published on the board's website. The, all the board do is they give a link to directly to the developer's website and obviously the board don't control what's on the developer's website so these are all challenges yeah. around housing which just time didn't allow us into but are important and i think you'll see more there was another one in dublin this week um as well in the past week so yeah, of where the high court overturned the decision of the board because they didn't follow due process with regard to it and that's in the in galway 200 and i think again in dublin it was around 200. So that's 400 units that have been lost through the process being not followed properly. If I could ask you one last thing just before we wrap it up, Neil, because I'm running this keen to wrap it up. Uh, if you could all achieve one thing in housing in the next five years, what would it be? Starting with Colette. I think that uh, as a city and as a council, my primary, uh, I think that we need to look at the Kent Station site for the development of residential units, the docks as well. Um, Unfortunately, in the city development plan, we don't actually have a master plan for the city. We are allowing the developers to come in with the master plan, whether it's the Dyke Road or Kent Station or Harbour Board. I will be calling on um, councillors to actually come in and have some vision for developing uh, inner city residential units on those sites. I think it's a, it's a, it's a must. Okay. It's an absolute must. Okay. Eddie? Again, the supply of houses. I'd hope that the housing list will be reduced under my tenure as in the next five years. I'd, I'd hope that we make more progress with regard to the government's affordable housing scheme, that more young couples are housed, taken out of the rental market. So I hope that the supply of houses will get more supply of houses and more people in homes. Again, I alluded to the families in emergency accommodation. While it won't happen overnight, I don't think any young family or any young person growing up be growing up in emergency accommodation in a hotel room or hostel or uh, hotel room and it'd be great to see while it may not be eliminated that it most certainly will be reduced over the next five years and the council as a whole and have to show the foresight and the collective willpower to make sure that the decisions are made and that more people are put in houses and less people are on the on, on the housing lists okay. that's good and michael finally yeah i'd say uh, it was i have three wishes uh, you can see on the on the to, to the which I believe would help alleviate the housing problem. Okay. One is I think that there should be a site tax yeah. um, on uh, a site tax sanction on sites that are hoarded at long term, and I think it should be aggressive. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that at that a national at level. At a national at level. National level yeah. Obviously, yeah. my concern is Galway, but um, at a national level, I think that, that they need to be disincentivized from hoarding up sites long term, and I think that's the first thing. The second thing is I'd like to see um, a national deposit scheme set up for renters, because I believe that, the, that we've seen it through the How PRTB. Literally, if you're going to rent a property, um, albeit, uh, well, obviously in the private market, that your deposit is paid into a national scheme run by the government of the day, as opposed to being the going into the private landlord's pocket. Because there's too many challenges around uh, where that money is going, trying to get it back, all of that. I believe that would also help. And the third thing is obviously like everybody else, I think that those measures along with others would see uh, a, a, an increase in the amount of social housing and, and affordable housing being built in the city. And those would be my three things. Okay. Okay. Um, one last comment that I'd make in relation to Final comment because we have to wrap up then. To follow on from, from Councillor Coe's comment, I'd like to see a small bit more leeway given to young first time buyers who are shown the ability to pay the rent over a sustained period. Now, we're not looking at reckless lending, but I'm just yeah. saying a little bit more leeway given to those borrowers right, right. who are shown an ability. So they're paying their 1200, 1200 euro per month in rent. I'd like to see maybe more leeway by the central bank, maybe to extend it past 3.5 times, just for those people who are shown the payment capacity because they're being restricted from entering the private market at the moment at three and a half times yet they're shown an ability to repay for, for, for
for house prices well in excess of that. So maybe a small believer just for the well, first time. Well, that's that's a tough fight for you, Eddie. But I, I absolutely admire you, you for taking it on. Yeah. It won't so I think I think um, you know we'd like to we'd like to wrap it up there if, the, if we may. It's it's a, an eternal debate. It's one that's probably going to run and run. And I don't think we've solved everything today, but I really would like to thank the three councillors in particular who've come in here and given us their time on a Sunday. Um, Councillor Michael Crow, Councillor Colette Connolly, and Councillor Eddie Hora. I think we've had a great, um, a great session on this. Indeed, so and I hope it'll be watched by many members of the public. And while Michael. we're thanking people, I'd like to thank Rachel for her research and Adam for sound as the new members of our team this week. We hope to progress as and we also go on. Thanks to Busker Browns for hosting Absolutely. us today in the centre of the city. And we'll thank you, Busker everybody, Browns. for watching. And the last point is we'll be in O'Reilly's uh, Bar and Restaurant Grill next, next Sunday. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.